Good evening to all, and welcome to another night, another evening of adoration, education, and inspiration. Please take a quick minute and share the Zoom link to your family, friends, enemies, and co-workers. There's still room in the Zoom. All right. So last night we began this incredible four-night event that has the reputation of bringing Christians from around the world together for spiritual food and sweet fellowship. We had Brother Jody Apple bringing us a wonderful message, a light to the nations. And then we had Brother Anderson George prepared from eternity. Tonight we aim to continue this trend and to do so we have some wonderful singing and some wonderful messages coming from and into your homes. Please note that these sessions are being recorded and can be viewed on the Caribbean Lectureship website. It is live streamed on Facebook and shared by the West End Church of Christ Bermuda page. It is our prayer that these sessions give you an increased appreciation and appetite for the one who declared, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but I will have the light of life. Our song leaders this evening are Brother Marlon Williams and Brother James Solomon. Our first song leader is Brother Marlon Williams, and I know, you know, he's all ready and set to lead us in song. So at this time, I invite Brother Marlon Williams to lead us in song. Thank you, my brother. Appreciate you so much for the fantastic introduction. We'll be singing two songs. Um, the first is on your screen, Oh Come, let us adore him. Um, we're going to sing this through twice. Uh, the first time in the way that you are accustomed to singing it, and the second time around, we'll just take it up a couple a couple octaves. Um, so certainly invite you to, to join along and let us focus on the words for God is truly worthy of our adoration. Let us join us all. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. His name forever. We'll praise His name forever. We'll praise His name forever.
name forever. We'll praise His name forever. We'll praise His name forever. Christ the Lord will give Him more the glory. chance to get the words up on the board. Well, this is a song I think we probably all know, all know anyway, so I'll just get started. If your brother has the words, then you can, you can put them up, and if not, it's all right. Earthly wealth and fame may never come to me. Let us join the song. Earthly wealth and fame may never come to me, and the palace fair in my may never be, but the come, the come what may, if Christ for me does care in any way. His hopes be home if he is only there in any way. There is home, let him come and go a day in any way. I roam, he keeps me all the way. So for my dear master, say. My cross, I'll meet me there in any way. His hopes be home is Christ, my Lord is there. Oft I'm tossed, I'm tossed about and driven by the foe. 
can go away in any way. He keeps me all the way, so for his, his dear sake, my cross thou me bear, and anywhere is home, sweet home, if Christ my Lord is there, well I will labor on till I am called away well till the morn shall dawn of that eternal day looking on to him who keeps me in his care and anywhere is home sweet home if Christ my Lord well, anywhere is oh, let them and go away. And anywhere I roam, well, he keeps me all the way. Oh, so for my dear master, say, my cross, I'll meekly bear. Well, anywhere is home, sweet home, if Christ my Lord is there. And anywhere is home, sweet home, let it come and go away. And anywhere I roam, he keeps me all the way. Oh, so for his, his dear sake, my cross, I'll need be there. And anywhere is home, sweet home, if Christ my Lord is there. Amen. All right. Wow. I can only imagine how we would sound if we were all gathered in one location. Oh my word. Just just imagine it for a bit. And don't don't be afraid to sing aloud home. Don't don't care what the neighbors think. That they're gonna listen and learn the song as well. All right. Uh, I do believe Brother Malan would have carried us all the way up in those notes to heaven. And I am so grateful for that wonderful singing. And I, I wanna thank you all for singing at home as well. We want to have Brother Cliff Villas at this time to lead us in a prayer. Let's good evening to our brothers and sisters. Let us go to Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we approach your throne, thanking you for the many blessings that you bestow on us day by day. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the most wonderful blessing of all, the sacrifice of your son on the cross of Mary. We want to thank the many Christians, Heavenly Father, who accept your grace. And now we are the hands, the feet, and the mouths for you in these challenging times. Heavenly Father, may we not shrink back on this awesome responsibility of taking the gospel to the rest of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask you to forgive us of our wrongs. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to continue to watch over guide and protect us. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the many churches of Christ who are, are on, on the Zoom platform tonight. Heavenly Father, we pray that we be encouraged and edified. We want to thank Heavenly Father, the many speakers, the two speakers that are coming on, Brother Bruno and Brother James Sanderson. Heavenly Father, we pray that you give them a recollection of all what they have studied, and they will stand for before us boldly, proclaiming your word. Heavenly Father, at this time, we pray for the war in Ukraine. We pray for the many distractions that are happening all around the world. As Christians, Heavenly Father, let us be mindful at the end of the Great Commission, you said you will never leave nor forsake us. So I pray, Heavenly Father, that we are encourage each other to be steadfast and mobile in these challenging times. Heavenly Father, as we go through these challenging times, let us remember, Heavenly Father, to encourage each other to be faithful unto death. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we continue to uh, be encouraged, Heavenly Father, no matter what life stories are. 
Watch over, guide, and protect us. I say this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that prayer, Brother Cliff. What's that? You haven't shared the live yet? Oh, um, I'm sorry. You still have time. You can still share that live and so that more people can partake in this session. There is still room in the Zoom. I'm just watching 420 devices on, and so there is still room in the Zoom. All right. So, uh, just take a moment and just share love in the chat. Let's go. let's share where we are from. Uh, put your name, your, your, your location, your congregation. Let's just share love. Let's fellowship in the chat. But we are getting ready at this time to receive God's word. Yes, our first lecture is the time of God's favor. And it's taken from Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 8. And our speaker will be Brother Thaddeus Bruno. Brother Thaddeus Bruno was born, raised, and converted to Christ on the island of Dominica and is a graduate of the Trinidad School of Preaching 1982. He was a bachelor's degree in Biblical Studies from the Theological University of America in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, 1987, and a master's degree in Biblical Studies uh, from the Sunset International Bible School, Bible Institute in Lubbock, Texas, 2015. Brother Thaddeus Bruno has served as ministering evangelist of the Church of Christ in Dominica for eight years, St. Thomas for 24 years, and now serves at the West End Church of Christ in Bermuda for eight years. He also serves as chairman of the Regional Organizing Committee of the annual Caribbean Lectureship known as the ACL. Throughout his ministry, Brother Thaddeus has been a speaker on various radio programs, at gospel meetings, in lectureships and workshops in the Caribbean, Europe, and the USA. He has defended the faith in three public debates, is an author, and has published articles in Think Magazine, published by Focus Press. He is also a published singer and songwriter. He is married to the wonderful sister Aline, Elaine for 37 years, and she is a soloist on him on his musical album. I am only a steward. Brother Thaddeus is the owner of the website thesebonescanlive.com and has adopted these words, these bones can live, as his life and ministry motto. It gives me great joy to present to us God's messenger for tonight, Brother Thaddeus Bruno. Thank you very much, Brother Adrian. If you can hear me well, all right, all right. I appreciate the um, uh, kind words in that introduction. You read it just like I wrote it. <laughs> I want to say it's a pleasure and a joy for um, me to be in your presence this evening and to be able to share uh, the uh, stage, so to speak, with my brother and uh, ministerial coll uh, colleague in the person of James uh, Sanderson. I look forward to his message um, to come. And I want to greet everyone in the audience and thank you very much for the opportunity to um, pour a little something in your cup uh, this evening. I want to direct your attention to the screen where in a while, we will have the text that has been assigned for my topic this evening projected, and I invite you to read it with me. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, I have answered you. In a day of salvation, I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages. The Holy Spirit in the text before us here speaks of a time and a day. The time is described as the time of God's favor. During this time, the favor of God is a dominant theme. It tells us of a day that would be characterized by salvation. And in the time of God's favor, God promised that he would answer his servants. 
And in the day of salvation, he would provide them with help. Just what exactly is the time that is under consideration here? Various theologians and Bible interpreters have put their ideas out there in the marketplace of thoughts for evaluation, for examination, and even acceptance. Uh, there, is, uh, there are a couple of gentlemen, one by the name of John um, F. Uh, Wildwood, along with another gentleman by the name of Roy A. Zuck, who in their treatment of Isaiah chapter 49 in the Bible knowledge commentary have this to say. They say, in the millennium, here called the time of God's favor and the day of salvation, the Lord will enable the servant to be a covenant to the people. So as far as these expositors are concerned, the day of God's favor, the time of salvation, the time of God's favor, the day of salvation does not belong in the present era, they have reassigned it to a future time that they dub the millennium. But Peter counsels us against the idea of subjecting scripture to private interpretation. Peter has offered us some hermeneutical counsel in 2 Peter chapter 1 and about verse 20 when he wrote, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What Peter is here arguing is that since the scripture is not a product of human imagination or invention, that the scripture is a product of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit reserves exclusive right to be the interpreter of scripture. And so we're familiar with the slogan, scripture must interpret scripture. And the same spirit who put an utterance in the mouth of Isaiah causing him to write about the time of God's favor and the day of salvation, that same spirit has reflected on this time period in the New Testament. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, as Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes to the church at Corinth, here's what he says to them. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Notice how Paul here quotes from the Isaiah text. He really does an exegesis of the Isaiah text, not only quoting it, but explaining it and adding value to it. And hence, what is uttered here for us in this text is what appeals to us, is what resonates with us in churches of Christ. For here Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, affirms, now is the time of God's favor, and now is the day of salvation. I thank God for this day of salvation and this time of God's favor. It is a time that is concurrent with the present Christian age, the present dispensation in which we live. It began with the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. 
And this day of salvation will end when Jesus Christ comes again. But someone might ask, why limit the time of God's favor and the day of salvation? Why limit that to the present dispensation? Will there not manifestations, iterations, and demonstrations of God's favor in previous ages? This is a good question. And the answer is a resounding yes. God did manifest favor. God did demonstrate salvation in previous ages. I remember how Genesis tells us that God saved Noah and his family in the ark. The Bible tells us that God saved the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. The Bible tells us that Naaman was saved from his leprosy when he was commanded to dip seven times in the Jordan River. God saved Rahab and her family in a house that was marked off by a red cord in the window. But all of those examples and samples and iterations and demonstrations of salvation in the previous eras, these were merely types of the salvation that is now available in Christ Jesus. As a matter of fact, Francis A. York, Caribbean scholar and theologian, in his work entitled, The Church Must Teach, has this to say. Here's what Mr. York says. He says, there have been many other salvations mentioned in the Bible, but none of them compares in greatness to that which belongs to the Christian. Now, there is a sentiment that we can say a hearty amen to, not just because it has come from the pen of a brother in Christ, but because those offerings reflect the sentiment of Scripture. And therefore, this is a sentiment that we can accept that now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. The question then before us is since the Holy Spirit who gave a prediction in Isaiah chapter 49 explains that prediction in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, then you and I must be interested in what else does the Spirit say about this time? Whatever the Spirit has had to say about this time should be influencing our attitudes, should be influencing our emotions, should be influencing our activities. And therefore we raise the question, what else does the Spirit say about this time of God's favor and this day of salvation? I want to share with you two points this evening, two things that the Spirit says that we ought to be cognizant of, that we ought to grow in awareness and in understanding of as we live in this time of God's favor. I want you to notice the text with me, which is an exegesis uh, from the Holy Spirit of the Isaiah text. Paul, as he writes to the church there says, working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says in a favorable time, I listen to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, in calamities, etc. 
So as the Holy Spirit here through the writings of Paul expands on the Isaiah text, we will notice that one of the points he makes about the time of God's favor is that during this time, God has made us workers with him in salvation and grace. What an awesome statement that in this day of salvation, in this time of God's favor, God Almighty, the self-existent one, the self-sufficient one, has chosen to make you and I members of the body of Christ, servants of God. He has chosen to make us partners, workers together with him in the dispensing of both salvation and grace. This is a marvelous idea because God Almighty doesn't need anybody. Amen. God exists by himself and God knows how to do things alone. As a matter of fact, God created the world by himself. God hung the moon without human help. God placed and positioned the sun without your partnership, without my partnership. God filled up the pool we call the Atlantic Ocean, filled up another pool called the Pacific Ocean, all by himself. And yet this God, who is self-existent and self-sufficient in this time period known as the time of God's favor, he has intentionally, deliberately chosen to partner with you and I in this work of salvation. God Almighty has ordained that no person can be saved unless you and I are involved in that process. But somebody may say, Brother Preacher, I'm not sure I agree with those sentiments. Didn't Joel declare that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved? Do we really need human intervention? Do we really need a human intermediary in order for man to be saved? Well, the Apostle Paul quoted from Joel's prophecy in Romans chapter 10, and he says there in that chapter, it will come to pass that whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. But listen to the questions that inspiration raises. How then can they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach except they be sent? You see that? And so these passages, these verses are agreeing with the idea, with the notion that Almighty God in this time of his favor on the day of salvation, he has chosen to partner with us in that process of saving lost men. And we see that demonstrated in the examples of conversion. When Saul of Tassus was misbehaving, persecuting the Church of Christ, trying to make a scorched earth out of it, he had letters of authority from the Jewish um, uh, authorities to track down and imprison Christians. And when he had done enough, Jesus decided that he would make an appearance to Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road. For brothers and sisters, friends and visitors, this appearance that Jesus made was not to circumvent or to interrupt God's plan of using human beings in the process of saving other human beings. But when Jesus had softened up Saul of Tarsus, and he asked, what do you want me to do, Lord? The Lord said to him, go on into the Damascus, and there it will be told you 
the things that are appointed for you to do. Saul would experience salvation in the day of salvation, but he would experience it at the hand of another human being. Because this is God's plan to partner with us, to make us workers together with him in the dispensing of salvation and grace. Even when Cornelius, a good man, a moral man, a praying man, a hospitable man, a man of repute in his community, even when his good works were so impressive that Almighty God took notice of it, God sent an angel to him, but the angel that God sent to him was not to tell him what he needed to say. To the contrary, the angel said, Send them to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He shall tell thee words whereby thou and thy house shall be saved. Nobody get saved in the time of God's favor in the day of salvation without human beings, servants of God, who partner with God, who put their hand in the hand of God to bring salvation to lost humanity. You and I must get a good grasp of that in the time of God's favor and in the day of salvation in which we live. I want to share with you a poem at this time that my ministerial instructor, Brother Parker Henderson, shared with our students at the Trinidad School of Preaching. He wanted to impress upon us the reality that we are God's agents, that we are God's hands, and that if we don't do, then Nobody goes, nobody gets saved. And this poem I share with you is entitled, The Living, The Way We Pray. And it goes like this. I rose to pray when day was done and prayed, O Lord, bless everyone. Lift from every heart the pain and make the sick well again. And then I woke one day and carelessly went on my way. I did not go to see the man just next door to me. I did not try to wipe the tear from any eye. I did not share the road with any brother on the road. But once again, when day was done, I prayed, Oh Lord, bless everyone. But as I prayed, there came to my ear a voice that whispered clear, pause. Hypocrite, before you pray, who have you tried to bless today? God's sweetest blessings go by hands that serve him here below. And then I hid my face and cried, forgive me, Lord, for I have lied. Let me but live another day, and I will live the way I pray. Brothers and sisters, it's good to pray that the lost be saved because this is the day of salvation. This is the time of God's favor. But after we have gotten through praying, we must understand that we are the hands, we are the feet, we are the mouths of God that must now reach out in sharing the message of salvation to those who desperately need it in Christ Jesus. In the time of God's favor, God has made us workers together with him in dispensing salvation and grace. But there's another thing that the Holy Spirit says about this time of God's favor that I want to call to your attention. Secondly, in the time of God's favor, God hears us, and he helps us. This was part of Isaiah's prophecy in a favorable time. I have answered thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee or succored thee. 
during this dispensation in which we live, Almighty God, His ears are open to us, and He helps us. He helps us because we have an assignment to be a light to the nation. And this is not an easy assignment by any means, because just as the nations have been in rebellion against God in previous ages, it appears that day by day, the nations are becoming even worse in their opposition and hostility toward God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and Christianity. The system that has been given by God to man in this dispensation, we have a huge task. We have a humongous task to be a light to the nation. But glory be to God. The God who has given us this assignment does not leave us by ourselves, but his ears are open to our prayers. And when we pray, he comes to our aid, assisting us with the mission that he has given to us. There are three things I want to share with you that we are to be praying about in the time of God's favor and in the day of salvation relative to our assignment to be a light to the nations. Notice how in the text Paul says, for he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now watch this. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. This is something we ought to be praying to God about and seeking his help in the time of his favor that we'll be able to conduct more blameless ministry. The posture of the Apostle Paul as a minister of God, was to give up his personal rights so that those who were out of Christ could have the opportunity to hear the gospel. Paul's ministerial philosophy was, I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And when Jesus Christ sent his disciples out on the limited commission in Matthew 10 and 16, he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, get this, and harmless as dogs. If we contradict our message, if we fail in the lives that we live to live out the message of the gospel and brothers and sisters we are becoming obstacles to those who need salvation in christ and therefore one of the things that we must be praying about one of the things that we ought to be seeking help from god for is to conduct more blameless ministry the gospel is offensive enough all by itself. A second thing we ought to be praying about is in the text before us, Paul says further on, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, calamities, beatings, imprisonment, riots, labors, etc. The second thing we ought to be praying about is to be more courageous in hardships. We're not going to be successful in being a light to the nations unless we show more courage when going through difficult times. Uh, members of the Church of Christ, we have been characterized in scriptures as soldiers. And Paul encourage Timothy to endure hardness 
as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know how it is in the place where you are, but in places I have been, people are turned away from Christ so easily by the smallest hardship, by the smallest difficulty. They give up on the Lord. And we need to be praying, praying fervently and passionately, seeking the help of God. Because we are on assignment to be a light to the nations and that we would be more courageous in hardships. Sometimes the hardship is that of ill health or declining health. Sometimes the hardship comes from having no health insurance. Sometimes the hardship comes from being unemployed for a protracted period of time. Sometimes the hardship comes from experiencing the loss of a child to death. What a terrible tragedy. Sometimes the hardship comes from the death of a spouse. It comes sometimes from being a single parent or having to deal with an unruly teen as a single parent. Sometimes the hardship comes from a cheating spouse. Sometimes it comes from a bitter divorce. Sometimes it even comes from a difficult to get along with brother in Christ. Somebody may say, Brother Bruno, you're describing a lot of difficulties there. Is this really the time of God's favor? Why are there so many difficulties in the time of God's favor and in the day of salvation? Well, remember, the Apostle Paul himself experienced difficulties as he conducted ministry for Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians, he tells about a thorn in the flesh that he had, and he prayed to God three times to have this thorn removed. But God said no. How could God say no in the time of his favor? Because God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for well, my strength is made perfect in weakness. My brother, help is available. God hears us, and God helps us in the time of his favor and in the day of salvation. Finally, the third thing we ought to be praying for is found in the same chapter, in chapter 6 and about verse 14. It was in this section of Scripture that Paul says to the Christians at Corinth, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship or partnership has righteousness with, un with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? And the thing we ought to be praying for is to be able to love and model a Christian culture, to love it more and to model it more. Mm -hmm. Because in many places, it seems, it appears that we are very much in love with the secular culture around us and even the religious culture around us. We seem to appreciate and love and admire and are attracted to that culture more than we are attracted to the culture that we have in Christ. I want to say tonight that we have our own culture in Christ. We are a nation, First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. We are a people, and being a people, we have a master, Jesus Christ. We have a message the gospel, we have a meal, the word of God. As a people, the people of God, we have a memorial, the Lord's Supper. As a people of God, we have a melody, it is the Lordship of Christ. As a people of God within our culture, we have one motive, and that motive is to glorify God. As we begin to wrap this message up, I just want to encourage us that in this day of salvation, we ought to be praying to God for help, for more blameless ministry, for more courage and hardship, and to love our culture 
in Christ more than we love the culture of the world. The culture of the world is reflected often in our hairstyles, reflected in our clothing. Even ministers of the gospel seem to be attracted to the religious culture around us, but we have our culture in Christ. I want to share with you some of the values that we have in our Christian culture and for which we should be praying to God and seeking his help in our Christian culture. We talk more about God's rights as creator than our rights as Westerners. In our Christian culture, we exemplify humility and leadership, not arrogant lording over God's heritage. In our Christian culture, we promote stewardship of resources, not exclusive personal ownership. In our Christian culture, we promote service to others as a sign of greatness, not demand that we be served. In our Christian culture, we believe our bodies are the temple of God, not it's my body and I'll do what I want with it. In our Christian culture, we promote heterosexuality as definitive of the nature of marriage, not homosexuality. In our Christian culture, we teach the brotherhood of all men and racial equality, not racial superiority. In our Christian culture, we are committed to modesty in clothing, not making provocative fashion statements. In our Christian culture, we use prayer and the gospel as tools for political and social change, not guns and violence. God forbid that we be attracted to the culture around us, that we love more the culture we have in Christ, because only in this way we can fulfill our assignment to be a light to the nation as we close. This is the time of God's favor, the day of salvation. But brothers and sisters, it will not always be the case. The day of salvation will eventually turn to the night of judgment. Jesus, as he conducted his ministry, was well aware of the approaching night of death. And he says in the gospel, I must work the work of him that sent me while it is day. For the night comes when men can work no more. Let's therefore partner with God, seek his help for blamelessness in ministry, courage in hardships and love of a Christian culture. These will better aid us, these will better help us in fulfilling our mission assignment to be a light to the nation. May God bless us in this effort. A hearty amen to Brother Thaddeus Bruno. Uh, I want us to just kindly in Zoom raise our two fists and shake it at Brother Thaddeus. Not because we are upset, but because God's spokesman showed up and spoke up. Ah, yes, sir. All right. I am so pumped and filled this evening, and we are only halfway there. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Continue to share that love. Continue to be excited. Get your Bibles ready again. We're going to have another spokesman of God coming very shortly. At this time, we have uh, Brother James Solomon to lead us in a song. So at this time, Brother James Solomon. Good evening, everyone. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. It will be our next song. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. Oh, we love you, adore you, we bow down before you. Heavenly Father, we appreciate 
she is you, O Son of God, what a wonder you are, Son of God, what a wonder you My soul from sin, send the Spirit within. Son of God, what a wonder you are. Holy Spirit, what a comfort you are. Spirit, what a comfort you are. You lead us, you guide us, you live right inside us. Holy Spirit, what a comfort you are. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. Heavenly Father, we appreciate you. We love you, adore you, we bow down. Amen and amen. We do have another song. Do I go ahead, Brother Sadeo? All right. Amen. You know, one day, one day, we will no longer have to sit behind computer screens, but we will reach that city of the new Jerusalem. When we reach that city of the new Jerusalem, we'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. How the ransom singers will together live that hymn. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. I'm singing, oh, what joy when we get home and we will rest beneath. That cloudless dome in that land where saints never die. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. In that mighty chorus, voices will so sweetly blend. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Gone will be our sadness, pleasure there will never end. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. I'm singing, oh, what joy when we get home. Rest beneath that cloudless dome. In that land where saints never die. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. A victory and love will be our everlasting theme. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Praising our Redeemer there beside the crystal stream. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. I'm singing, oh, what joy when we get home. Rest beneath that cloudless dome. In that land where saints never die. We'll sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, by and by. Bye. Amen and amen. 
Amen, amen, amen. Oh, wow, wow, wow. What a joy it is when we can lift up our voices singing hallelujah to the one who deserves it. Oh, yes, oh, yes. So thank you for being with us still. And at this time, we have Brother Dominic Dos Santos, who is going to give us a little report at this time. Uh, Brother Dominic Dos Santos is the director of the Trinidad School of Preaching. And so I will give him this moment, and he's going to share some exciting stuff for us at this time. Brother Dominic Dos Santos. Good evening to all. Again, it is just great that we could be together and to share in this wonderful time together. We pray that God will, will continue to bless our efforts. Are you seeing my screen, um, Adrian? Lovely. All right. We know that the Trinidad School of Preaching is, is growing um, to, to some amazing heights, along with the Jamaica School in the South. And we continue to work, we continue to push together, we continue to rally around each other. And we are so thankful for the Caribbean Lectureship because it's a place where we really blend, we really gel in an amazing way. Thank you, Ken Dai, for, for your labor of love over all these years. I just want to put in, in a really plug here with Ken. And if you have information about years went by, pictures, stories, accounts, send it to Ken so that we could continue to write this amazing history. We want to emphasize that at the Trinidad School of Preaching, with a powerful and firm foundation, the school forges ahead with a strong faculty, a high performance culture, and hearts that really seek and love God. We want to be able to, to, to share this with as many as possible. We have room uh, for students in September, and we're looking forward. Uh, we have a, a one year program now, two year program, and of course, you could do your degree in, in three years. And then also, they have an online option. We know that some people can't leave their homes, but come on board. We have a dormitory for available, qualified and experienced faculty, and an amazing learning environment. In terms of upgrading, one of the amazing things that's happening right now, school, along with partners in progress, that was Brother Bill McDonough, has embarked on the establishment of a, what we are calling a mission experience. What we're doing is opening up the way for students from America to come and, and Europe as well to come to the Caribbean and learn how to do the evangelism that Tavius just spoke about. How to be able to go back into the field, preach the gospel, teach as many as possible, win many and, and establish congregations. As a result, the faculty, all of them have completed their degrees and, and through Bible um, through studies with the Valley Bible Institute, and they're continuing forward, moving forward, doing really, really well. In fact, many of them are doing their masters as we speak. We want to reach out to. Here's what's happening: we could we could retool you, we could retrain you, upgrade your qualifications to get a degree and towards even masters. So we're calling all grads, come back. Come back and, and get involved in the program. Not only so, if you're a graduate of the school, go ahead and give us a shout out. But here's what we want. We have to, we have to reach, you know, to, to really maximize this. And so we're calling all of our graduates. Starting right now, send 100 US dollars per year. Uh, Brother Clancy gave us this idea some years ago and he gave us $100. Not even a graduate of the school. Could you imagine that? But... He demonstrated something that Thaddeus was talking about, that passion for the word, that passion to, to, to reach forward and to help others as well. So we call on all graduates, send back for us and support our students, support the program, let's go forward. This year, our graduation was just absolutely fun. And you could see from the picture on board that we really had a good time. Brother Larry Wimaya was our feature guest speaker. And here's a group of our, our graduates from this year. And we continue to march forward. Larry preached up a storm, really stimulated us an amazing way. But this picture speaks a thousand words. In was Brother Michael Harris, but next to him, Sister Shirley Pascal. We honored her this year. Because every year we take a little time out to honor people that we believe make a big difference. Sister Shirley was there from the very beginning. She took care of the of the all the directors come all the way up until we started to have local directors, all right? But we want to honor her and we continue to honor her and we believe she's such an awesome and wonderful sister, especially where evangelism is stirred. So the school is marching forward. Notice on top of the list, 
of leadership, financial recording, parenting, marriage, eldership in the Caribbean. We are moving forward. And while it is free, Hello, Yes? Just sorry to disturb. Um, um, I don't think we are seeing the progression of the slides. All right, okay. Let me... All right, let's... What you saw? I think it is the first slide, but uh, yeah, we didn't see the pictures. All right, okay. So let me go back then. Uh, tell me, you seen it now? Yes, let's see it advance. All right. Same problem Brother Apple had last night, so let's see. Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's still saying COVID slowed us down. Ah, it is All advancing right, so now. Go back, go back to the pictures. All right, we're seeing pictures now, thank you. All right, lovely. All right, so we're seeing that this, these are pictures from our graduation, 2022. <coughs> Here's Brother Larry Way Meyer with us, and he was our feature speaker. Many of us know him, um, especially from in the, in the context of Aruba, but now he is back in Lexington. And, and continuing to be there for us and to support us. In this picture, we have Sister Shirley Pascal. And as I was saying, we try to honor uh, someone every year. And this year we chose Sister Shirley Pascal. She's just an awesome, wonderful person, especially in terms of event. We want to continue to, to praise God for her. As we reach out to congregations in the area, then evangelism, number one. I really appreciate um Thaddeus and mentioning Brother Parker Henderson, this was number one. The main thing is always the main thing. So in terms of that, we want to know that we could develop um, leadership, financial recording, parenting, marriage, eldership in the Caribbean. We will teach it. Just call us on board and we will get there. And while it is true that COVID slowed us down a bit, the school was involved in at least winning 15 souls you know, so far just for this year. And we continue to march forward preaching the gospel. I wanted to let you know, San Fernando appointed her elders. Point 14 is on the way. And the preaching school, Trinidad School of Preaching, has been helping to make that possible in a meaningful way, visiting and teaching these congregations to get closer and closer to what God wants. We launched our new website, www.tsop. That ME at the end is for our mission experience. That's what we told you about. That's what we're launching and we're looking to get students from the States as well as from Europe. All right. So to come on board and to have a wonderful time. 2025 version. We'll have a new dormitory. Teachers will have their masters and even their PhDs. PhD stands for and determined people. So we will be ready. A mission school extension through Europe. Um, expanded student body doing evangelism constantly. Being a light to the nations. Hack us. Dominic Dos Santos or Dominic Dos at gmail.com. Info at tsop.me. And you can get the application forms online. All the, the immigration forms, you can print them straight off the website. Use them. Come on and let's share in a wonderful time together. The Caribbean has needs. Education is central to satisfying those needs, and the TSOP is an amazing option for training. You could register today and be part of an amazing legacy. I am sure tonight there are many, many in this gathering who would have experienced the Trinidad School of Preaching. Let's get on board. Let's do a Send them to us. Send your young people to us. Send your retired people to us. Send those that are looking for a job. Come on, God has worked for you in this amazing culture that, that Tadius just spoke about. The legacy continues. May God bless you. Amen, amen. Exciting stuff. Remember it now again. Uh, if you or someone you know is very interested, head over right now or after the session to the website and register. Explore the website and register. Don't miss out on an opportunity like this. Don't sleep on an opportunity like this. All right. So we're getting straight into our, I want to thank Brother Dominic uh, for that report, that presentation, uh, exciting us to do some good stuff. All right. All for the glory of God. So thank you so much for that uh, report and presentation as well. We're going to our second lecture at this time, which is entitled, The Honor of God's Servants. Isaiah 49, verses 5 to 7, and our presenter is Brother James Sanderson. Brother James Sanderson began preaching God's word when he was 15 years old. After falling away from the Lord for 13 years, he returned to the Lord and in 1998 decided to go to Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas, where he received his preaching degree. 
while at school he became the associate minister for the Northside Church of Christ in Lubbock. After graduation, he preached full-time for both the Beulah Church of Christ and the Central Road Church of Christ in Michigan for the next 15 years. During that time, Brother Sanderson wrote a book on evangelism, which is called Saving Souls in the 21st Century, or applicable, and have held close to 100 evangelism workshops all over the world. Since then, his workbook has been translated into nine different languages. Because of his love for reaching the lost, in 2015, he began working for the Southern Oaks Church of Christ in Chickasha, Oklahoma, and presently for the Baker Heights Church of Christ in Abilene, Texas, as a full-time evangelist. He also works for Home Missions and the Herald of Truth as one of their evangelists. He has appeared on TV programs, talk shows, and in videos trying to reach the lost all to God's glory. Brother Sanderson is the father of two beautiful daughters, Jessica and Jill, Two amazing grandchildren, Roxy and Riley, with another grandchild on the way. I'll take no more of his time and let him speak before his grandchild arrives. I now have the pleasure of presenting to us God's messenger, Brother James Sanderson. All right. Can everybody see this? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. You'll have to start this slide. There we go. What? All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that uh, introduction. Uh, I just realized that that bio that I sent you is a little bit off. There's a few more additions, but I'll tell you about those uh, after we after we get done today. Uh, I got to tell you, I was really concerned about this after having to go after Brother Bruno. I, I, I mean, we might as well just go home. I, I I don't know what else I could say to his lesson. It it was it was unbelievable. So, brother Bruno, I'll, I'll try. Maybe we can add just a little something. But uh, if not, you you guys will understand. You you all know brother Bruno well. Tonight I've been tasked with uh, this um, the honor of God's servant Isaiah forty nine five through seven. Here's our Bible reading tonight. Isaiah 49, 5 through 7 says, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the presence of Israel, and also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him who man despises, to him who the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and, and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel, and He has chosen you. Now, as we have seen in this text so far, that we've been going over the last couple of nights, this is written to Isaiah, and he is a servant of God. But I want you to notice something here. If you notice that the you here, when he's speaking to Isaiah, is capitalized. If, that is, if I understand this right, that means that the King James Version, the New King James Version, is saying that this is talking about Jesus. Could there be a double application to this? Now you think about that. Just think about that as we go through the lesson. Could it be applied to both Jesus and the prophet Isaiah? So I hope you don't mind, but I would just like to get real with us tonight. Can I do that? I've got to let you know that when I preach, I'm an open book. When we read about Isaiah, when we read about these prophets and apostles, they are open books. We, we read about all their failures, all their mistakes, everything they go through in life. I would like to talk to the church tonight and just be real. So let's just be real. 
There are a lot of discouraged preachers, church leaders, and Christians out there. Would you agree to that? Brother Bruno talked about that tonight. Tonight we are going to look at Isaiah, as we already have. We're going to see a little bit from Timothy, from Ezekiel, and, then, and David. And then I'd also like to share my story with you. So let's be real tonight. Let's just, let's just lay it out on the line and be real. I was born in 1964. Yes, I am 57 years old. I know some of you think, man, I didn't know people lived that long. Well, they do, okay? And I was born, I want to put it on the map here for you, in the United States here in, uh, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, okay? And that is way at the top of the United States. And I lived there until in Ypsilanti until 1972. And I have to tell you that when I was growing up, as a baby and as a, as a young child for many years, I had a serious, serious drug problem. My mom drugged me to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. That's right. She sure did, and I praise God for her doing that. Last time went on, we moved to Kalkaska, Michigan, and no longer did she have to drag me. It became not only her faith, but now it became my faith. And I was baptized at 12 years old. And we lived up here in northern Michigan in Kalkaska. And I was getting excited. I mean, man, I was riding my bike to church services when my mom couldn't make it. I'd, I'd ride all across town. I started preaching when I was 15 and 16. They were like five-minute sermons. Everybody wants to know what happened to those five-minute sermons, but um, they're kind of gone now, as you, as you are going to see here in a minute. But I was excited. Things were going so well. And then one day, at the age of 17, my grandmother was going to move to northern Michigan. My mom was telling her the story about my, or the preacher, about my, my grandma. And she, he had, she had mentioned that she had been married and divorced and remarried. My grandfather was an alcoholic. He did terrible, terrible things. I, I won't even get in there to tell you about these things. I never personally met my grandfather. But without talking to my grandma, without ever seeing her face, this preacher decided to kick her out of the church. That split the church in Calcasca. Half of the people went this way, and half the people left. And I was torn between the two. Then, because of that, my, my dad, who had built her a brand new house in northern Michigan, my grandmother decided not to move up there because she was removed from the church. And so that caused my mom and dad to get a divorce. I have now, at 17 years old, lost my church and my family. I told you I was going to be real with you. And I left Jesus. For 13 years, I left Jesus and got into every kind of sin you can imagine. But then the Lord put me down hard. I mean hard. And I said, okay, Lord. We're not going to do that anymore. And I came back to the church. I started preaching a little bit for a church at the Beulah Church of Christ and decided, me and my family, to move to Lubbock, Texas. And when I moved to Lubbock, Texas, and I was at Sunset, the most enjoyable years of my life. I love being at Sunset. I started working for the Northside Church of Christ. And I love the Northside Church of Christ. Wonderful people. And one day, some ladies talked my wife into teaching class. The first time. It's a very encouraging day. Now, you got to understand, the Northside building is kind of separated. There's like a, two buildings. And one has a classroom in it, and there's an alleyway, and then the other building with the auditorium. And so my wife brought in my daughter 
at sixth grade and they taught class together. Isn't that encouraging? But my wife did something wrong. She let the kids go. She didn't know she was supposed to do that at the end of class. She was supposed to keep them and everybody comes and gets their kids. Well, one of those kids ran across the street and went to the convenience store across the street. The mother came and found my wife and found my daughter and she yelled and screamed at them. My daughter said she could feel her breath on her face. This was supposed to be a, such an encouraging day. And the very first time they taught, and this is their first experience to have somebody scream at them. I told you I was going to be real. We went from there to back to Beulah. We went to northern Michigan. We went back to the church where we were going to, where I was, I was asked to come back and preach at. And I was there for 10 years. This is a building, of the, this is the picture of the church building. And as you can see, this is a, a very beautiful place. I love to look at water. There's Crystal Lake, the church building here, and the air was right at the bottom. There's Lake Michigan out there on the other end. This is the town. It's about 400 people. And our building was right just downtown on Front Street. I get there. I'm excited. I know we can do great things for Jesus. And I preach my very first sermon. And when I get done, there are two men waiting at the back of the pews with a Bible in their hand. And they said, James, you should have said this. Or you should have done this. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you say this? I took their encouragement. I said, thank you. Looked about it. I thought about it. And I went on with a smile. But then they were there the next week. And the next week. And the next week. And every sermon I preached, they criticized and criticized and criticized. And this went on for one year. Do you know how hard that is? Do you know how hard that is to put lessons together when you know you're going to be discouraged? I told you we were going to be real today. I'm reminded of what Timothy, what Paul told Timothy. He said, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. I continue to go on. Those two men, unfortunately, they left. Now, here we are in the town of Beulah. You can see the downtown here. I told you I love to look at water. So I would drive down every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I would drive down the side here. I would come back to the lake here. And I would drive down the lake. And then I would come back and park right on this side because this is right about where the church building was, was because I love to see water. Do you realize that I had to stop doing that? Because when I did that and I would preach Sunday morning and I would come back Sunday night as I drove down the side of this road, I would see cars park, our members with their boat trailers. And I could look out on that lake and I could see this group fishing and another group water skiing and another group fishing. And church services are in just a few minutes. You pour over these lessons. You go over these lessons and you want to encourage people. You have all this energy and you find the church is out there being unfaithful. I told you we were going to be real today. Those are tough days. Paul also tells Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 
We have to preach the word when people want to hear it, and we need to preach the word when people don't want to hear it. Sometimes it's in season, and sometimes it's not. But Paul told Timothy, you just keep preaching. Those were tough days. Now I'm in the book of Mark. It's my first work. I'm going to go through the whole book of Mark. We're going to preach through it all. I promise myself, don't skip over any of the hard verses. Hit every verse in the book. So we get to chapter 10 on marriage and divorce. We get into the book. I take us over to the book of, of Hosea. I wanted to look at Gomer and look at how God dealt with Gomer and Hosea. And this brother, he's he's got a version of the Bible. I've got a version of the Bible. And in chapter 1, verse 6 and 8, his version said she and my version said Gomer. And he said, your version is wrong. It can't say that word. What happened is when you go back and you look at that, the word is Gomer is in verse 3, and it says conceived in the Hebrew. It's all it says, conceived. Well, who conceived? She did. Who's the she? Gomer. Both words are added in the, in the English to make the sentence flow. He thought that his version was the only right version, and it could only say she, but actually it could say she or Gomer. It could go either way. He was livid. He split that whole Bible study. He was just literally through a fit. And the next Sunday he comes in, he comes in and he holds this newspaper up. Now we only have six pews. Everybody can see everybody. And he holds this newspaper up while I'm preaching and telling everybody, I am not going to listen to you any longer. Do you know how hard it is to stand in there and to preach when someone does that? Those are hard days. But I just kept preaching. I told you, we were going to be real today. Timothy says, Paul told Timothy, they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. He was, he was buying into a myth. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. I'm studying with a lady. Her mom said, James, you've got to get with my daughter. She's fallen away from church. So I get with her, go over and study with her and her husband. And her husband has a Baptist background. And I have several Bible studies with well, every time we have a Bible study, he goes back and tells his dad. His dad is a Baptist. And his dad would tell him continually, well, I don't agree with that. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. Okay, that's what happens. But we keep studying. One day I'm sitting in my office. It's at night. And I get this phone call. And this phone call comes in. And it's a man. He's saying, look, I'm from the Inland Baptist Church. Our preacher is leaving for the next four or five months on a mission trip, and we are looking for some guys to come in and fill in to preach. Would you be interested? Well, the longer I start talking to this guy, I suddenly realize this is the dad that has been telling his son that he doesn't agree with me. And so I interrupt him. I, I figure, well, he doesn't know who he's talking to. If he did, he wouldn't be asking me to come preach. And I interrupted and tell him who I am. And he said, James, I know exactly who you are. And I know exactly who I'm talking to. He said, would you be willing to come and tell all of us what you believe? I'm just hanging on the phone like, when does this ever happen? So I go back to the church. I tell them they're all excited. We didn't have elders at that time because the church was so small. So I told, told everyone, they're all excited. And now it's five weeks later, and the next day I'm going to go there and preach. The man that's going to preach in my place calls me up and says, James, you can't go be with those Baptist people. That's wrong. I said, I'll be right over. I went over to his house. I brought my Bible. I said, can you show me? Because I don't want to do anything wrong that the Bible would say I shouldn't do that. He said, well, I don't have any verses. I have nothing that says that you can't go, but you just can't. It's just wrong. And I said, well, let me open up my Bible and show you where 
Saul of Tarsus went to people in the synagogues. They weren't even talking about Jesus. And he went and shared the gospel with them. And he didn't go in to be one with them. He went in to bring them out. And so I said, brother, if you can't show me anything, I'm going. So I go. And I get amens and amens in America, in the Church of Christ. You don't get very many amens. In the Baptist church, man, they were amen. I'm taking them through the every step of the gospel. Amen, amen. Now, we went, when we got the baptism, the amen, amen stopped. And they asked me afterwards, would you come back? Absolutely. I go to my car. I get the cell phone, and I've got all kinds of messages. The man that was back at Beulah sat there and told everybody how wrong I was. He told everyone how bad I was, how sinful I was, being over there at that Baptist church. People were leaving, new converts were leaving with tears running down their faces. And my family and my children had to sit there and listen to this man say that. Within a year, six people left. They divided the church. They wrote letters to all the churches in Michigan telling them how bad I was. And they went and started the church down the road. Folks, those are hard days. Those are hard days. Endure hardship. That's what Paul told Timothy. Endure hardship. So, I went to, now I'm going down to Saginaw, Michigan. Been in Beulah for 10 years, moving down to Saginaw. I get there, we've got elders. I'm thinking, boy, this is going to be wonderful. Here's a picture of the church building there. I am there three weeks. And one of the deacons walks in and says, I am gay. I am leaving my wife. She is divorcing me. And here I am. I'm like, wow, great. The preacher that they had fired because he wasn't doing his job and they couldn't figure out why it just wasn't showing up at all he lives just down the road and so i call him and say hey brother you know you're still a christian they just let you go because you weren't doing your job but you still need to come to worship i couldn't talk him into coming well i finally figured out why because just a week after that they hauled him away to prison he was sexually molesting one of the children in the church Oh, and the mother is now taking us to court. And it's all over the news. I mean, it's all over. It's the talk of the town. And I'm asking God, God, did you bring me to the wrong place? And have you put me in the wrong spot? I didn't know what to do. I've never experienced this before. Those are hard days. Psalms. David says, My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? I think that's what the community was saying. Where is your God? Those were hard days. Then we moved to Chickasha, Oklahoma. Go to southern and down to the south. I get the dream job. I am wanted to get out of preaching because I'm too evangelistic and I just want to be a full-time evangelism minister. So what do we do? We take this job. We're excited, right? Boy, this is a this is a great place. Things were happening. I mean, it was wonderful. And I am there for three years. And my wife comes to me and says, I do not love you anymore, and I am leaving you. Do you understand the depression that that drove me to? Do you understand the pain that I felt? I didn't know what was up. That doesn't happen to people like me. That happens to those people out there, not the preachers. And my wife left. 
And I'm not going to give you the details. You don't need to know the details. But there were lots more details. But my wife has left me. And I am so crawling on the ground. I am thinking that God is done with me. That he, he can no longer use me. I, I don't know which way is up. Those are very, very hard days. Do you know how hard it is these days to still see my grandchildren and my children? It just brings it all up again. It wasn't supposed to be that way. I told you I was going to be real. I'm an open book. I'm reminded of what God told Ezekiel. Now, I'm not equating what happened to me with Ezekiel. But watch what he says to this prophet. Also, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke. His wife is going to die. Yet you shall neither mourn or weep, you sh nor shall your tears run down. Sigh in silence, make no mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips and do not eat man's bread of sorrow. Those are hard days. God asked hard things of prophets. And he's doing that to show them that God's not going to mourn for Israel when he takes them away. So the question is this, is there hope? Is there hope for those people that struggle? Preachers, elders, Christians, we're all the same. We all go through the same things. Is there any hope for these people? So it's one of those days. It's a Monday. I'm at Beulah, back in Beulah. And I am going to quit. It is over. I'm done. I cannot take these people's problems anymore. I'm going to tell them on Tuesday I am quitting. And I look down on my desk, and what do I see? This message. It says, Dear James, Jesus loves you. Keep preaching. Keep preaching. Love Maggie Myers. A child wrote this. She had no idea what I was going through. It's sitting on my desk. And I cried like a baby. And I said, okay, God. I'm not quitting. <laughs> Is that the providence of God? I kept going. No quitting. I'll keep going. We went from 16 members to over 50. In the 10 years there, we had over 100 baptisms. There was a lady that told me when she got there, she said, James, I don't know where the Beulah Church of Christ is at. She lived there for 40 some years. It's right downtown. The church did not know they were there. When I got there and when we left, that town knew we were there. And then one of the converts that I helped to bring to Christ, God gets all the glory, John Frank, he is still preaching to this day at the Beulah Church of Christ. All for God's glory. Amen? Saginaw. We went from 40 members when I got there to over 100. And when all of that happened with the media, nobody left. We kept everybody. That is all to God's praise. We had a, de, uh, a weekly de denominational, I was on a weekly denominational TV program where people called in questions from all over the United States, and I would answer those questions on a panel of different preachers or pastors or whatever they called them. We worked with a Christian church, and they worshiped with us. You, can you imagine a denomination coming and worshiping with us twice a year? We worked with them so strongly. This is the TV program that I was on. It was called Ask the Pastor. 
And the very last day that I was there at Saginaw, that we had a friend's day. We had our biggest attendance of all time. It was over 160. And do you know who was in this picture besides myself? There is a Catholic nun in that picture. She came. There is a Methodist pastor that came to that church service. There is people from the Lutheran church and the Catholic church and, the, and one of the elders from the, uh, from the Christian church. And we came this close to merging with them. And all of that is what? It was to God's glory. And then Chickasha. We went from 8 to 16, had eight, from 8 to 16 Bible studies a week. We had a 78% retention rate of people who were converted to Christ. We had a weekly denominational leaders Bible study, just like we did in Saginaw. Here is a picture, a Bible study that I started up. Do you know who is in the blue here in the corner? That is the Catholic priest. He came to a Bible study that we had every week. There is a preacher from the, from the Christian church. There's the, the youth pastor from the, from the Christian church. There is uh, this man from the Salvation Army. He's, he's the preacher over there. And there are two men on the end and one picture you can't see from the Pentecostal church. And we sat down for two years and studied God's word all to God's glory. And God is glorified. And now I live in Waxahachie, Texas. I work for the Brown Street Church of Christ. You can see a picture here. We have over a thousand members. God picked me up and put me on my feet. Not man, not any person, but God picked me up and put me on my feet again. And he gave me a wife that I met at a Bible study that loves me. Do you know how incredibly wonderful it is to go home and to know that your wife loves you? That is a gift from God. And I'm sorry, but I have no longer two children. I have five. And I no longer have two grandchildren and one on the way. I now have six. Those are blessings from God. I am the chaplain for the police department. What an evangelistic tool. I have eight to 13 Bible studies a week. Things are happening here. I'm, I'm now teaching for an evangelism school over in Fort Worth. That's going to start up this, uh, this fall. And all to God's glory. God is being glorified. Isaiah, Timothy, Ezekiel, David, they all went through the hard days. What does the Bible say in Hebrews 11? All these people were still living by faith when they died. Brother mentioned it before, stay faithful unto death. And I'll give you the crown of life. God is glorified. Conclusion. How do we honor God's servants? How do we honor these men and women that are serving God? How do we do that when things are so hard in their lives? So many difficulties that Satan throws at them every single day. What do we do with these people? Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be of no advantage to you. Honor these servants, these workers of God, by obeying them. When you're not obeying them, you're obeying the words that comes out of their mouths, that comes from, their, from God's word. That would be an advantage to you. Encourage your leaders. Lift them up. Pray for them and their families every day. And if you are one of those leaders, don't ever, ever, ever give up. 
and leaders, love your members. Because the same things that we go through is the exact same things that they go through. I never knew what it was. I would counsel widows and say, I know what you're going through. No, I didn't. But when I sat there on that pew and my wife was now gone, I knew exactly what they were going through. And now I could relate to them. Those are hard days for those people. Love your members. And the bottom line for every one of us is to never, ever, ever leave Jesus. The lesson is yours. Wow. Wow. Um, Brother, I am. Yes. Brother Sanderson. I need to give an invitation here before we end. Is that okay? You go ahead right ahead, brother. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you can't have this honor. You can't be honored by God because sin separates us from God. And we've all sinned and fallen short of his glory. So God looked at this whole world and couldn't find anybody to fix the problem. That's Isaiah chapter 59, verse 16. He was appalled that no one could be found. So he set his own arm in righteousness. He worked his own arm in righteousness. And he sent his son, who was our propitiation, to satisfy God's wrath. Jesus, because he was sinless, when he went to the cross and died for our sins, he was it satisfied God's wrath. But now we must be in him. And how do we enter into Christ? Well, the first thing we have to do is be taught. And then once we're taught from the word of God about Jesus, we need to believe what Jesus, what it says about Jesus. Once we believe that, then we have to have a regime change in our lives. We can no longer be on the throne. You have to come off and Jesus has to go on there on that throne. He is now Lord. And once you confess him as Lord, God says, now you have to change the direction of your life and repent of your sins. Change and turn towards him. Once you change and turn towards him, you take this person who is separated from God, you bury that person into Christ, and you raise them up to life. Your sins are now buried with Jesus. This is where you meet Jesus in his death. And you're, you are now raised to life. And as long as you continue to walk with Jesus, God will take you home. That is called the good news. And we must obey that good news. I pray that you have. And if you haven't, find somebody. Let's study with you. Get with somebody here. Or find the church of Christ that is closest to you. Get with them. And let's study. All to God's glory. All for his kingdom. Thank you. Many, many men. I invite Brother Marlon Williams to lead us in a song at this time. Kill the soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God, careless soul. Oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone, and oh, how sad. To face the judgment Unprepared to meet thy God O careless soul O heed the warning For your life will soon be gone Oh, how sad 
to face the judgment unprepared to meet the God Hallelujah Amen, Amen, Amen I would like us to raise our fists again to Brother James Anderson this time, that story, that testimony was really, really powerful, bringing that message home to us. Tonight has been a very powerful night, and we have been truly filled tonight. Wow. I, I do have some changes to make to my introduction of the speaker. Uh, I should entitle it Story Time with Brother James Anderson. Uh, sometimes we just have to keep it real. And he did just, he did warn us, in all fairness. He did warn us, uh, and boy, he has touched many lives tonight. Brother James, I thank God for you tonight. We have had two wonderful speakers tonight, uh, bringing God's word to us authority, by the authority of God's word. These spokesmen have brought it home to us, uh, and we didn't have to leave our houses. Uh, it came right into our living rooms, and so I'm, I'm giving God glory and praise for that. All right, and so... Uh, again, you heard the salvation call. If your desire is to reconnect with Jesus and the family of God, we welcome you with open arms and we are willing to walk by your side. If you desire to be saved, would you make time for it today? Wherever you are, we will get to you, to where you are, and we will get you to where you need to be. Just let us know, and we will get you to where you need to be. Don't ignore the call, because God is calling, and His arm is open. All right, so I want to just say thanks again to our presenters tonight. They have certainly filled our basket with goodies. I want to thank you for being so uh, such a loving audience. I look here and I see so many wonderful smiling faces. I see so many wonderful names as well as wonderful devices. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. It's such a pleasure to spend this moment tonight with all of you all here. Yeah. I want to just pique your interest for something that is coming up tomorrow, another great an exciting night. Uh, we have tomorrow, the 12th of July, uh, we have our Master of Ceremonies, Brother Osafa Gordon. We have song leaders, Brother Karen Spence and Brother Sean Williams. And we have two lecturers, one on engraved on God's palm. Engraved on God's palm from Isaiah 49, verse 15, Brother Adrian J. Ayers. And the second lecture will be, Who has borne me these? Isaiah 49, verse 19 to 21, by Brother Elton Terry. Now I know that you are interested in this as I am. And so you're going to find yourself here and you're going to bring somebody with you because you know they missed out tonight and it won't have to happen again. And for chance they would have missed out tonight. They can find this recording on Facebook as well as YouTube as well as the Caribbean Lectureship website. And all will be there for you to view and to take in and to absorb and to benefit from. Alright? I want to... Uh, Reserve Brother James Solomon to lead us one song after we say uh, a prayer and we will be um, going out into our breakout rooms. But I'll give you more information on that very shortly. And so at this time, join me at this time as we uh, go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you with boldness for you have allowed us the opportunity, the privilege to communicate with you all because of Jesus. And we thank you for the words that were spoken tonight from your word, the testimonies of your greatness, the responsibility that is laid upon us. Help us, dear Father, to take a full charge of this, to do what we are called to do, to, to share that light, and that is Christ, to share this light with the world so that they too can partake in what we are partaking in, that joy that we feel, that comfort, that assurance, that confidence, all because of Jesus our Lord. Help us to spread that light. Help us to take the message so that they can hear. They wouldn't know unless we go farther. And so help us to uh, use ourselves wherever we are and to speak the word of God with confidence. We thank you for the stories that were born tonight and the many lives that are impacted by tonight's lessons. Continue to bless us all that we'll continue to grow, that we'll continue to draw closer to you. And for that soul that is contemplating salvation, we pray that they their hearts be softened and that they make that decision even tonight and that they go through those waters of change and walk with Jesus as we are walking with Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time we have a song by Brother James uh, Solomon.
Thank you so much, brothers, for some wonderful lessons. And sometimes in life, we do go for some stuff. But we'll understand it by and by. Trials dock on every hand, and we cannot understand. All God would lead us to that blessed promised land. But he'll guide us with his eye, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. I oh, by and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. I, of the cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we've wandered in the darkness, heavy hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord, and according to his word, we will understand it better by and by. I, oh, by and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. I, temptations, hidden snares often take us unawares. And our hearts are made to bleed for some thoughtless word or deed. And we wonder why the test, when we try to do our best, we will understand it better by and by. I, oh, by and by, when the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. I, oh, by and by. When the morning comes, all the saints of God are gathering home. We will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. Amen.